All right, well, that was no easy flow. So let's see exactly how that worked. Now, the key to this particular bug was twofold. One, you had to recognize that there was a certain under allocation going on, but two, you had to handle some interprocedural analysis. Back in the Stack Overflow section, when we were talking about detection mechanisms, we talked about how there's static analysis tools that will you know, go read your source code for you and try to find the bugs. But I said that a lot of them don't do particularly well with interprocedural analysis. So meaning when tainted data goes into a function and comes out of a function and so forth. Well, quite frankly, a lot of us humans don't do particularly well at that either. There's only so much state you can juggle in your brain, especially when you're not, you know, the developer who knows this code in and out. There's only so much you can do to, to kind of see, you know, what's going on with code base. But let's go ahead and uh, follow the flow of ACID and let's see what we can see. So we've got this rule coming in and this rule is passed into NFT expression first. So we pull up our first, our next, our last, our more. And really all of these things are doing is essentially iterating through this set of rules and expressions and things like that. So the first one that's going to basically take the passed in rule and pull out the data. So I think we can safely assume that that is going to be attacker controlled data. And consequently, this expression that comes back is going to be attacker controlled. Next, that asset is going to be passed in along with the rule itself to more. What does more do? Well, more is going to use the rule and the expression, and it's going to say if expression is not equal to the last expression, essentially, and if expression ops is filled in with something that's not null, then, you know, basically it's going to be returning true or false based on those particular conditions. Well, what does last do? Last just basically goes forward in the data array to the D length entry and, you know, returns that pointer. But I think we can basically assume here, you know, again, you could go dig into the full code, but for our purposes, you know, just looking at this very short little while loop, when we see first, we see more, we see next, we can get a sense that this is just sort of used for looping through. But I think we can expect that, you know, in the case that, for instance, this rule dlang was zero, then last would essentially return back, you know, the address of the data itself. And if expression just from right here came back as the address of the data itself, then essentially what it's looking for is a situation where you basically say last on something and it points at the expression itself, meaning, you know, it's the last entry because there's no data set in this rule or no data length rather. All right, so, you know, getting rid of that. And again, we said next is just gonna continue to iterate through. So an interesting thing that you have to have been able to pick up on here is the fact that this is actually an exit loop condition. So we said that this was a set of rules and we said that, you know, we've got first, we've got more, we've got next, so it's iterating through. So essentially, while there are more rules to iterate through, is an asset loop exit condition because basically the attacker controls how many rules there are going to be, right? There could be 50, there could be 100, but however many it is, that's how many times you go through the loop. Because we can't see any explicit break condition here, so there's no way to get out earlier, so the exit condition just is while there's more expressions. All right, then in this expression that we said is attacker control, there's this ops and offload flag field, and we can see some bit math with what looks like a flag. And so this is particularly interesting because essentially, if you imagine that there were like, for instance, 50 rules and you loop through each and every single rule, you could have a number not equal to 50 that have this flag set. So for instance, if we were, for the purposes of my run through, I'm gonna pretend there were 50 rules, but only one of them has this flag set. And so that means that effectively this num actions is attacker controlled because they get to choose how many times this is incremented. They get to choose how many times through the loop and they get to choose based on this data, whether or not it's going to have the flag set. So you could have 50 rules and 50 num actions, or this is the under allocation case we're gonna find. You could have 50 rules and one num actions, and that's gonna have implications as we continue along in the code. All right, so the expression next is just you know moving forward to the next expression and that would continue looping through until there's no more rules to process. All right, then if num actions is equal to zero, so if nothing had one of these flags set, then it's just gonna error out immediately. 
So again, we're going to assume that the attacker would set that to whatever they wanted to set it to, where here I'm going to pretend it's 1. So they're going to pass this num actions set to 1 into this NFT flow rule alloc. So let's see what that does, and we're going to assume 1 here. Okay, well, basically it allocates a size of struct, so that seems like that's not attacker-controlled size, so that's not an attacker-controlled allocation. Then it's going to pass that num actions, which is 1, into flow rule alloc. So this was NFT flow rule alloc, and a sub-allocation inside of that is flow rule alloc. All right, digging down into that, assuming that we've got a num actions of 1. This is where, you know, I added this little comment here to, to basically say, there, I did give you a definition of struct size if you wanted to look at it, but just to make things simpler, you can imagine that, you know, this rule, this flow rule thing, it has inside of it an actions. The actions has a convention that is typically used for C code when you want to define a variable length array. It's basically an empty array. And this is going, and when you have an empty array, it's basically going to say, okay, well, the rest of this data in this array is after this struct and it'll just be allocated somewhere else, not allocated when the struct itself is allocated. So the whole point of this construction is to allocate one of these flow rules, but also allocate enough space for some array of entries afterwards. And so here I was just trying to tell you, this is going to create rule of action entries where the number of entries is num actions, which we said is one here. Okay, so the size is allocated and it is also initialized because this is a KZ alloc, so it's zero initializing it but this is going to be turning out to be the crucial sort of under allocation. The fact that there is num actions is only going to be one, so it's going to have one entry out of these 50 rules. Later on, there's going to be a different loop that can loop through 50 times, and it'll be operating on this array that got allocated here and was allocated some smaller number of times. So again, we can't tell based on this code. It would be, you know, you have to read the entire code and then put it all together in your mind and then say, oh, hey, what if, you know, num actions was smaller than the total number of rules? And then you would realize that you could, as an attacker, cause an under allocation here. All right, continuing on, num actions one goes ahead and sets it into the num entries field of the struct. And then num actions is a, well, that's an attacker controlled loop exit condition. But in this particular case, because you're guaranteed to have as many entries as you had num actions during this allocation time, it's guaranteed to sort of not have any sort of problems, beyond which you're also not copying attacker controlled data inside the loop. So there's nothing particularly carrot case about this. This is not one of the vulnerabilities that we'd be concerned about here. This is just safe. All right, so back up. So we were we were coming down NFT rule, uh, rule alloc. We came into flow rule alloc. We saw, okay, well that led to effectively a sort of under allocation there, right? There was, you know, the the rule actions entries was essentially under, alloc all, under allocated. So we're going to show this as sort of, you know, semi attacker controlled data in the sense that the the size of the array itself is actually essentially attacker controlled. And also the num actions went in and then it was set as one of the fields of the struct. All right, but then the rest of this is uninteresting. Assuming the allocation succeeded, then this is not going to be null. And then these are just non-attacker controlled values all filled in, uh, and so we don't care about that. All right, now we're stepping back up another function and we're back in NFT flow rule create. So we had jumped down into this. We had caused this allocation to occur. We had seen you know, the, the flows were allocated inside there. They were semi-attacker controlled but we know that this led to an under allocation of this action entries array. Okay, so the code just once again takes that rule set and calls first on it to get the first expression. So that's attack control. Then it's gonna do a fixed size allocation. And so this context is just gonna be some allocated and zeroed context that's not attack control, not erroring out. Got this other non attacker controlled net thing. We've got this hard coded value, so that's all clean values. But then we once again come back to this construct of the expression and the rule and more, so while more. And again, that is an acid exit condition. So it's going to continue looping through all of the, let's say, 50 rules. Okay, so it does that. Well, this right here turns out to be a function pointer. So it's just checking if the function pointer is non null, and if it's null, it just errors out. So now down here, 
We're going to have the attacker controlled expression, the semi attacker controlled flow that was allocated up here, and the non attacker controlled context. And then I give you the hint here that this function pointer offload just calls to this other function that I gave you the definition for. But of course, nobody likes having to try to trace function pointer control flow when they're trying to audit code. That always makes things much more difficult. Okay, so in NFT dupe net dev offload, we've got our non attacker controlled context, we've got our semi attacker controlled flow, and our attacker controlled expression. Now here I put a comment to try to keep you on the path of what this actual vulnerability is, where I said assume priv is not going to be acid. So we have attack controlled expression passed in here, and I said assume it's not acid. Now the definition of NFT expression priv is that it just grabs the data, the data itself is just like a one byte value. Now I don't actually know that this is not acid, I haven't dug into it. If it was ACID, it would lead to a different vulnerability, a out-of-bound read vulnerability, right? Because basically this priv seg sreg dev, if that was fully attack controlled, then it would mean, you know, they could index up to index 255 in this regs array. The regs array does not have 255 entries, so this could be like going out of bounds of that buffer. So again, that's not related to the vulnerability of the CVE that we're trying to drill down on right now. But, you know, if you are curious, I think it would behoove some folks to go dig into that a little bit and see whether that is actually attacker controlled or not. Because if it was, then that would mean OIF is also attacker controlled, and that would have implications for this next thing. But for now, let's just go ahead and take the assumption and assume this is not attacker controlled, this is not acid, this is not acid. And so now we're going to call this function with these parameters. And this is where the vulnerability ultimately lies. So it's at this point that you have to remember that that rule actions entries was under allocated and we assume that it was allocated as one entry. Well, this turns into the other location where that array is actually used. So this array is used and it's using this context num actions, which isn't attacker controlled as you'll see in a second here, but it'll be interesting to, to see how an attacker can leverage this. Okay, so just, uh, you know, let's assume that's an under allocated array with a size of one entry. Now OIF we said is non-attacker controlled, net is non-acid, therefore dev is non-acid, it's not null, and the context num actions is non-acid. So basically that's going to be zero to start out with and then it's going to be plus plus. So that's going to go from zero to one right now. And so this initial access is just fine. You've got a entries, which is of size one. You're accessing entry zero in the array, which is a valid inbounds entry. So cool, now this means that this address points at a valid location. The ID is written to a valid location and the dev is written to a valid location. So this is basically where you need that interprocedural analysis. You have to think back to, how did I get here? What is this function? Well, if we think back, we will realize that right now we are getting to this function inside of a while loop, a while loop with an acid controlled exit condition. So we said, you know, assume there's 50 times that this thing will go through this loop, 50 times this particular function pointer, you know, the, this function pointer calls to this function, will ultimately be invoked. So 50 times calling through this and this num actions getting plus plus in an array that is only one element big. So that's the fundamental problem here. This next time that you go through the array, it's going to be accessing num actions of one and then it's gonna plus plus it up to two. So already, as soon as you access entries of one, you are now out of bounds because there was only entries of zero as valid because it's a one sized array. So now this entry is something out of bounds and I don't have you know a good coloration for out of bounds. So I'm gonna use uninitialized because I'm gonna assume that you go off the end of the bounds and let's say that it's uninitialized memory off the end of that bounds. So now all of a sudden we've got this ID being written to the ID field of what is not really a pointer to a flow action entry, which is just uninitialized memory now being clobbered by some non-attacker controlled value. Dev likewise being written to some uninitialized memory. So that's out of bound write one and that's out of bound write two. So let's go ahead and visualize that. It would look something like this. This 
flow rule action entry zero, that's all good. The ID gets set to a clean value. The dev gets set to a clean value. We don't know, you know, presumably the other stuff is all initialized properly. We don't really know or care about the rest of this. What we care about is the fact that this indexing into this array all of a sudden goes out of bounds past whatever the under allocated size is that the attacker controlled. Now all of a sudden, this ID is also being written out of bounds here, and the net dev, net device pointer dev is going to be written out of bounds here, and then again, it'll happen again. And so the attacker controls how often this stuff is written out of bounds and thus effectively how far, but they don't have you know full complete arbitrary control because it's only you know at this offset zero and offset 24. So this is why I make those sort of distinctions about out of bound writes versus heap overflows. Yes, this is occurring on the heap, and so you know in some sense it's a heap overflow because it went beyond the bounds of some particular allocation. But the you know to me the sort of defining characteristic of these out of bound writes is that they're not sort of just a linear you know beginning to end sort of overflow. They have potentially gaps. They have potentially non you know non continuities where they can skip forward. Sometimes that's beneficial, sometimes that makes it a little bit harder to use it. In this case, for instance, you know, the attacker doesn't get to smash everything everywhere. They have to smash at specific offsets, although they can, you know, then, you know, move forward 80 at a time and, you know, do at 80 offset 0, 80 plus offset 24. So how would an attacker utilize this? Well, they've got to feng shui it. They've got to basically cause an allocation to occur that becomes adjacent to the area which they know they can write into. So they cause some beneficial data structure to be allocated adjacent to this. And then subsequently, when they start stepping out of bounds, you know, maybe setting offset zero to five, or the author said they could also set this to four. Uh, maybe that's beneficial. Maybe that's enough to win, but probably not. Ultimately, uh, the original author wrote a blog post actually after I had already written up this slide. But uh, basically, he, util he focused on this dev pointer and essentially would write this somewhere that was ultimately beneficial. Now, he also ultimately had to turn this into what's called a use after free situation. We don't talk about that in this class. We talk about it in vulnerabilities 1002. But, uh, but this just gives you the notion of uh, your out of bound write eventually leading to some sort of beneficial write in someone else's data somewhere. So what was the fix for this ultimately? Well, there was a whole bunch of changes in terms of, you know, adding a full new callback function and stuff like that. You can see the full patch for the details, but, you know, relevant to the stuff that we just covered, a important part is that this num actions, which was ultimately the thing that I said is effectively attacker controlled in the sense of you're going through, you know, 50 rules and you get to choose whether or not this num actions increments or not. So now it's only going to be incremented if, you know, this new function, new callback function is invoked and enabled, and if, based on the expression, it says that it actually should be incremented. So again, I said that um, basically the original author did a write-up of this vulnerability after I had already sort of made these slides uh, based on just the advisory. So I recommend going and checking that out if you want to learn more about how he actually successfully exploited this vulnerability.